Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, we are fortunate to have uh, Bonnie Claire Silva Santos with us today, talking about defetishizing material culture in museums and public education. Uh, I've been tasked with the responsibility of introducing her, and it is my great pleasure to talk about Vani. I, I met Vani now almost 10 years ago, uh, sometime this summer in uh, Mina Gerais. I uh, was invited to come and uh, be one of the, uh, I think we were in an advisory or consultory position, and they were just opening, uh-oh, I think I messed up there. They were opening, they were opening their Africa Studies uh, Center, um, having African Studies Centers in Brazil uh, is, is uh, on the rise. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it has its own unique uh, history, but I was there with an international panel and we were talking about it and uh, Vani was just becoming the chair of, uh, of a director of this, uh, this department. Um, and it was my pleasure to meet her and her colleagues and talk about the future of Africana studies writ more largely uh, in Brazil. Uh, that led to a very fruitful conversation, which in part led to Vani coming here, uh, and in part led to a couple of weeks ago us getting married. But that's not what we're here to talk about, okay? So I will stay on point. And, uh, you know, uh, Vani has had a very distinguished career as a historian in uh, Brazil. Uh, she is one of the principal historians of Africa in Brazil. Uh, she's been here now for, well, during the periods of the pandemic is when she moved here. And she's uh, now based here at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where she is a a curator in the Africa Galleries at the Penn Museum. Uh, and I believe she has a lectureship here in Africana. Is that correct? Research affiliate in the center. There you go. Um, and she continues to work on material culture, um, African material culture. Uh, she's writing a very important book on Guinea-Bissau and material culture in Guinea-Bissau and uh, on women's place uh, in material culture and during the period of uh, enslavement, um, uh, which is, is when people are looking forward to this uh, volume, which kind of looks at a different side of the entire uh, experience of enslavement and the slave trade. Uh, looking at a woman who was actually a slave trader uh, on the west coast of Africa. Probably not a word you hear much of, but it's a definite intervention that will probably help us better understand uh, that process. Uh, uh, Vani and I have been collaborating in a very large project of looking at material culture and museums uh, around the world basically looking at how Africa is treated, not only in Africa, but how Africa is treated in the Americas, how Africa is treated in Europe. Uh, that has allowed us to visit many museums and check out many monuments all over the world, and we're not done yet. Uh, I think you're in for a treat. She is going to talk about some of her work, uh, looking at the material culture in museums. Uh, particularly her work at the Penn Museum. Um, let me see, did I miss anything? She's been very important in African studies in Brazil. Uh, she helped uh, foster and cultivate the African Studies Association uh, in Brazil. Uh, and uh, she's been involved in several international collaborations uh, about uh, African material culture. She's one of the leaders of the big uh, Atlantic Ivory Project, which is an international project. Uh, I think it's based out of Portugal right now. It used to have a dual base when she was at UFMG. 
in Portugal and in um, Minas Gerais at the University, Federal University of Minas Gerais. Uh, I'm just not trying to forget anything. Did I forget anything? Okay. Uh, so without that, um, I offer Bonnie Claire Silva Santos. Okay. <clears throat> um, good evening. I want to thank Professor Tukufu for this presentation and for being an incredible collaborator in scholarship and life. I want to thank Professor Tamil Charles, who directs the African Studies Center and has been so helpful in getting me here. I thank the staff of Africana in or put everything together. Thanks to, to the Penn Museum for the partnership. Finally, thank you all for coming here this night and for those that are following this talk online. Um, I, I will make a short pre-introduction <laughs> uh, of this talk that I, I propose thoughts for humanity through new ways of thinking about education in the educational space such as anthropology museums and the colonial mentality makes people think of Africa as a marginal place in Africans as a homogeneous mass of undeveloped people affected by slavery and colonialism. It's the duty of museums as educational institutions to undo these mistaken views about Africa and the Africans, because they generate prejudice and unequal treatment. Thus, I problematize essential questions about objects' origin, their agency, how they are displayed, who named them, and the narrative about them. These aspects together can lead to other form of representation of black people and their material culture in museums and therefore promote a more critical and liberating education. This talk addresses the violence and the racism involved in the withdrawal of material culture from African continent in the process of naming objects through the lens of art dealers. Questioning who named the objects emphasizes the need to decolonize the narratives and the vocabularies about objects in museums and the museological thinking about the African material culture in their collections. These arguments also apply to most museums of ethnological vocation located, located in, Af in the African continent, as these resulted from colonial actions. Therefore, they still reproducing imperial narratives about the objects. To close these initial words, I want to make a statement. This presentation today does not focus, focus on the return of African objects, as the return doesn't end the museum's responsibilities to decolonize these institutions. Decolonization is not simply moving things from one place to another place. Decolonization requires at least three things. One, making the museum an institution free of post-colonial power structures. Two, creating a place that actively discusses and, and acknowledges the role colonialism plays in cultures and objects. And three, finally, museums must focus not just on objects, but on the narratives they create and display to visitors. In other words, the fetishizing museum is part of the same process as decolonizing the narratives of object histories. In this presentation, I want to problematize a question. Do people who collect the objects name them? Also, I want to address three specific things. First, 
naming African objects as a fetish was a transference of European bias towards toward Africa. Second, I will highlight the intricate relationship between the idea of fetishism and colonialism in the 19th century, when European authorities applied a vocabulary based on fetish to justify the occupation of the continent and colonialism. Finally, I will explore the narrative of some objects from the Pan Museum Africa Gap collection, sold initially as fetishes and presented to the public today based on their meanings in their context of origin. Now I'll go to my first point. Naming the object, the term fetish in the early Atlantic world. The origin of the word fetish is not Af African. However, fetish summarizes the origin of the European view of African material culture, culture in the modern world. The word fetish is, a, is an evolution of the Portuguese term petiço, also spelled petiço, and petis. Since the medieval period, the word petiço or sorcery was part of the Portuguese legal norm, norms that typified sorcery as a severe crime in Portugal. Therefore, in the first half of the 15th century, before establishing relations with West African coast, there, were, there was already an idea of sorcery related to mobilizing evil forces in Portugal. This interpretation was transferred to Africa and not the other way around. In other words, the attribution of the origin of fetish and witchcraft or sorcery to Africans is erroneous. In West Africa, fetish appeared in Portuguese documentation since the 16th century. The reports of outsiders are full of a description of the ex existence of an indigenous African god revealing the unknown god or condemning the agency of the objects. Since the 16th century, Portuguese missionaries and traders started to apply the term idols and fetishes to religious material culture on the African on the Atlantic coast to justify the evangelization of the population and the Portuguese authorities to have a monopoly on the Atlantic coast. It was the subject of my dissertation. Besides traders and missionaries, the Portuguese Inquisition had a cru uh, crucial role in the circulation in the Atlantic of the word of words such as fetish, mandinga, and the others associated with the population of African origin. In the 18th century, many cases of sorcery were reported to the Portuguese Inquisition against black people residing in Brazil, Portugal, Cape Verde, Angola, and Guinea, because they were using empowered bundles seeking for healing and body protection. In some, before colonialism, traders and missionaries similarly applied the word fetish on the West Coast, on West African coast, to explain the agency of objects. Naming objects in West Africa was a transference of European reality into the African context. The literature from the 15th to the 18th centuries was crucial to define the new steps of white men towards colonialism in the 19th century. Second point. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's move to 19th and 20th century. The collection of fetish and colonialism. As I said before, I want to problematize this question. Do the people who collect objects name them? Let me move to the other. In the 19th century, the vocabulary of sorcery and fetishism had more strength in the context of the colonialism debate. 
with the increasing presence of Europeans on the continent, the discourse, the discourse against supposed fetishes also increased. Soon, projects to ev evangelize civilized people without religion and exterminate fetishes became the primary justification for European rulers to invade African cities and seize power. In this context, European missionaries and colonizers advanced into the continent interior, but unfortunately, this context made room for the systematic removal of objects from African societies through looting, private and institutional expeditions and religious missions. As a result, they began to collect African things more systematically, transport them to European museums and call them fetishes. Two paradigmatic example, examples were the punitive expedition in 1897 to Benin and the Dakar-Djibout mission organized by the Institute of Ethnology of the University of Paris and the National Museum of Natural History from 1931 to 1933. This mission became an example for many museums worldwide. Besides France, other European countries, countries such as Belgium, Germany, Holland, and Portugal also carried, carried out their systematic collection in African territories under their colonial domains. The United States also participated participate in the scramble for Africa. Museums and private collectors acquired objects of African material culture from different sources. Since the end of the 19th century, the Penn Museum African Collection has been formed through six different acquisitions form. One, Euro-American missionaries, as the Reverend uh, Robert Nassau, who donated the first objects to the museum in 1891. Two, purchasing from art dealers. Three, archaeological expedition to Egypt. Four, um, uh, uh, from Euro-American intellectuals, such as Amanda Johnson uh, and the couple Talcott and Sophia William that went to Morocco in the end of the, at the end of the 19th century. Fifth, from ethnological expedition, and finally, from donations. In 1891, this guy here in this photo, the American Presbyterian missionary Robert Nassau offered to the Penn Museum 175 objects from his religious mission in Gabon where he lived for 10 years. The lot donated by Nassau consists of utilitarian objects such as baskets, ceramics, knives, currencies, and musical instruments. Because of his, his, because of his, his religious or theoretical orientation, he avoided to collect the so-called fetish. In 1905-04, Nassau published his monograph, that is here, Fetishism on West Africa. For him, fetishism was a superstitious regard for the power of insignificant material objects that wove witchcraft and sorcery into every aspect of African thought, government, family, work, and daily life. How, for Nassau, the fetish was not the origin, but the loss of the religion. Nassau was not alone in his bad thoughts. This recurring discovery of religion's absence fit broader colonial projects in representing Africa as an empty space for conquest and colonization. With no God and having the fetish as the center of belief, the colonizers suggest, suggested African lacked any transcendent claim to political sovereignty. Now I'll move to my third talk. 
Are we with me so far? Yes. Okay. Now, the stories museum tell. Now, I address the narrative of some objects from the Penn Museum after collection. Sold initially as fetishes and today represented to the public based on their meaning and in their original context. I will retake my initial question. Do the people that collect the objects in situ name them? My answer is yes, they do. The people that collect the object in situ name them. Then museums follow the collector's field notes to catalog objects. I offer two examples of two art dealers, an Englishman, Ling Roth, and a Swedish American guy called Amanda Jensen. Johnson was a translator and professor and a senior lecturer at UPenn. He traveled to Luanda between 1922 and 1924. He made contact with local authorities, even with, with Sobas, Sobas. So he had a caravan of 55 men he worked in the east of Angola and bought hundreds of objects from the region of Ilunga. Amandus, when he came back to Philadelphia, sold most of the objects uh, to a guy called Henry Mercer. Mercer resold the objects to the Penn Museum. It was a total of 249 objects. This photo that you see here is uh, Johnson with his other partners, and here is his, when he was buying some objects, and here is very clear the, the position of power between them, among them. I want to highlight that Johnson named the object that he collected. He wrote about the meaning of some objects according to the information given by the people he bought them. However, he decided by himself to register 55 objects as fetishes. Most of these objects are empowered things. For example, a group of beautiful open work frames and panels represented, representing figures with arm extended, with a roll in the back, sculpted in wood. There is no ambivalence about these objects. However, Johnson chose to give the object the generic name of fetish, following the tendency to exotize or fetishize African culture and place them, and place them in a primitive place. The five, the five framed figures that you see in this slide, and I mentioned before, purchased by Johnson, are beautifully displayed today in the African galleries of the Penn Museum. There are some interpretations about these objects, and some authors suggest that these figures that you hear, these sculptures, are a representation of the Zambi Apungu, the creator, creator god in Bakongo culture, also, also all other people, other authors say that the open arms are also a reference to the influence <laughs> of Christianity in the region. However, according to my research, these sculptures are not a reference to Christianity, but to the local symbolism of crosses that existed in this, in this region before the Portuguese presence. Nor are they fetish nor were they ambivalent objects for the people of that society. These pieces were carved by local artists empowered by a priest or ganga and used to protect hunters in their huts. The Portuguese Joaquim Carvalho that was in Lunda in the end of the 19th century 
produce a lot of re records about the framed figure in a small village like this one that you can see here. Now let's talk about something more complex about collecting objects. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. On February 18, 1897, ships and British troops with nearly 3,000 armed men invaded the Kingdom of Benin and assaulted the capital. The war lasted until February 21, 1897, and ended with the capitulation of the King of Benin, the arrest of and deportation of Oba to Calabar, in the looting of palace objects. British troops invaded that kingdom because the Oba refused to comply with the agreement with the British, which guaranteed free trade to the British in the region and hurt the sovereignty of Benin. This violent episode is known in the historiography as the punitive expedition. As war spoils, British officers and soldiers took Benin more than 3,000 objects produced in ivory, wood, ceramics, coral, and among others, the famous bronze. Objects from the palace of the King of Benin began to be identified by generic designations such as, such as fetish, mask, pendant, statue, bracelet, figures when they arrived in the museums. The entry of these items, in, items into museums led them to this connection between the object and its social history. Such descriptions were well accepted at the time because they echoed the false news spread by colonial administrators, soldiers, missionaries, and travelers. In addition, art dealers also played an essential role, role in the naming, uh, in naming the object, in naming uh, of ethnological objects. Seen as a mix of ethnograph ethnographers and market connoisseurs, they played a decisive role in cataloging the objects purchased by museums. An example is the art dealer Lindy Roth. He's the guy. In 1987, the English surgeon Felix Roth participated in the punitive expedition against Benin. As a reward for his military service, he received a rich booty which he sent to his brother, Lingy Roth, an art dealer established in Halifax, UK. Interested in expanding his business in the United States, Roth donated about 20 objects for the, from the booty to the Penn Museum in Philadelphia. Thank you better. This was just a small sample of his big stock. Along with the objects, Roth sent a letter to the director of the Penn Museum <clears throat> stating two things. Here's the letter, but I make one, I made one <laughs> description for you. <laughs> so what, what, the, what does he say in this letter? So along with the object, he sent a letter stating two things. His brother obtained the object through the punitive expedition in Benin, and he could sell them firsthand. Finally, Ling Roth asked to publish an article in the museum's prestigious magazine called the Bulletin of Free Museum of Science and Art of the University of Pennsylvania. Link's Roth letter is essential for understanding 
how the diaspora of objects from Benin occurred during British colonialism on the West African coast and how things were presented and traded in the, in the art market. A few months after this letter that you can see here, Roth wrote the article, a, a article called Personal Ornament from Benin, and he published it in the prestigious journal. It's the journal. Among the objects donated by Roth was an ivory br bracelet, which he also which he also wrote about in his article. However, his narrative about the ob of the bracelet was part of the colonial and racist mentali mentality of the time, which fetishized uh, and dehumanize the society of origin to justify colonialism and sell the objects. Let's see what Ro Roth argued about the bracelet. Roth article has seven pages, contain a formalistic description and reproductions of the 32 objects. Here are the objects. He sent the article and um, uh, some photos and also some kind of uh, um, uh, description like this one of the object. So they were 18 metal bracelets, six bracelets, two ivory, two made of ivory and, and the four of metal, three hairpins, one ring and four pendants. Roth described his objective uh, like to briefly describe some of the personal ornament of the people, mainly of the order of bracelets. The result is a purely stylistic description which seeks to identify common patterns between the pieces. According to the author, the specimens illustrated in his article did not undergo any special choice. Very influenced, influenced by his Eurocentric perspective on African people, Roth added some false information about the social use of the bracelets to reinforce his thesis that these were a violent and primitive people who cut off body members if they need to remove the bracelet. But let's talk about the bracelet. It's the beautiful bracelet that he didn't have any kind of information about, and he created a lot of false information. So here's what he wrote about the object. Most of Henry Lingroth's interpretation of the ivory bracelet are wrong. Everything that you see here is wrong. His article presents a formal and rather superficial description of the pieces indicating only their similarities, the material and the supposed functions. Second, although he highlighted the importance of material and artistic production, Ross insisted on the argument of dehumanizing the people of Benin. Third, he had no information about the symbolic and static reference of the pieces. Instead, Roth relied on a vague and precise <coughs> reference. It is said that to inform that the ivory bracelet was placed on the hand or feet of individuals. And, and when it was necessary to remove the ornament, the person would have the limbs cut off. Here is the considerable inaccuracy. This bracelet was, was worn only by Benin royalty, and nobody had the limbs cut off. Four years after this text, Roth published, published the book uh, the Art of Benin. Uh, okay. mm. He wrote this book in 1913, 10, like 110 years now. It is 
It is the first study on this subject. And in the page 19, he wrote this uh, statement. Uh, politically, it's the first, it, it is of the first importance that our rulers have a deep knowledge of the native race subject to them. And this is the knowledge that anthropology can give you. For such knowledge can teach what form of taxation are suitable for particular tribes or the, or, or the stage of civilization in which we find them. In this book, the fetish is the center of the narrative. Roth worked in favor of the colonial project. So he explains how it was possible to use anthropology to govern the people of Benin and ensure that those people were found in a primitive stage, unlike Europeans who saw themselves as the civilized ones. In other words, the plundery of Benin heritage was a central part of the British project of colonization and subjugation in Africa in different, in, in different continents. Roth joined the other propaganda media that spread a negative image of Benin in Europe and portrayed the Edo people as, as savage. So I want to offer you another perspective about this beautiful object that he lied about. When analyzing the objects, we must ex examine all the elements that makes up their artist's production. Materials, the highly specialized workshops and guilds where they worked, patrons, and society's relationship with these objects. For example, the ivory bracelets carved by, by specialized professionals are part of the symbols of power still used today by the Oba of Benin City in public ceremonies. In addition to the, in addition to the Oba, other royals also require bracelets let me show. Here's one, a photo from uh, 1997. In addition to the Oba, other royals also require bracelets, particularly when they repeatedly, repeatedly swing the ebane, this ceremonial sword, during the most important festival in honor of the Oba, the ancestor. The Oba and holders are dressed in highly elaborate customs and place ivory bracelets on, on each wrist. When the Oba or the other royal person swings his bang, the bracelet, which is long and cylindrical, protects other insignia he wears as well as the beaded nets. Who made these ivory objects? Renowned artists produced symbols of power for the royalty king of many each group specialized in ivory such as in each group specialized in a material such as ivory, copper, and others. The ivory carvers were experienced and belonged to a guild created by the Oba Ewar called the Igbe Salmon. Under the royalty, under the royalty commissions, the most experienced ivory carvers engraved insignias of power intended for the elite, such as finely decorated elephant tusks inset into the bronze head seated on the altar. Uh, I think that's a little bit not in order. I'm sorry for that. So, so the most experienced ivory carver engraved insignia of power intended for the elite, such as finely decorated elephant tusks inserted into the bronze head seated on the altars of the past obas, trumpets for public ceremonies, bracelets, swords, thrones, pendants, and others. Artists specialized in ivory also carved utensils for Ifa consult consultation 
for the most prestigious diviners, such as divination tips, fly sweaters, rattles, containers for sacred kola nuts, and other accessories. Igbe sound, artists made spoons, pork, salt sealers, and trumpets for local and use for local use and export. In this sense, the bracelets mentioned by Roth was carved by highly trained sculptor. knowledgeable of the symbols of royalty. To conclude the analysis of this bracelet, I examine the details. I examine the details of the mo motifs represented on it, which refers to the material culture that involved the transatlantic slave trade in the Benin region, such as the square bottles of gin and coral beads. You can see here in his hand the coral beads. In addition to these goods, other objects were part were part of Atlantic circulation, such as a pipe, umbrella. You can see the umbrella on the other side, hat, cup, and beads. For Kate Carnal, this bracelet was carved between the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century as evidenced by the presence of the umbrella and the square jean bottles that is right here under his under his underneath the feet the dutch who became more pre present in benin in the 18th century introduced this type of a bottle in the in the region carnau also emphasizes that the four human figures in this bracelet were inspired by the ancient representation of the Portuguese from the 16th century on other objects from Benin. The frequency of a foreign merchant carved into royal objects indicated that these men became an important source of regional, regional prosperity. They took goods and news from Europe and the Americas to Benin and returned loaded with enslaved people. So this bracelet contain records of material culture of royalty and the Atlantic slave trade preserved in museums. Moving to my conclusion. Museums play an essential role in educating and re-educating the public about the material culture of African tradition displayed in their spaces. Understanding the historical process in which the fetish discourse was created is essential to problematize and remove this word from exhibitions, online and printed catalogs. In addition, understanding how symbols of power and objects of protection became fetish is became fetish. Uh, must be part of our commitment as educators to decolonize museums and end the racism and the religious intolerance that still affects Africa, African and Afro-Atlantic religions. How to fetishize the imperial narratives present in museological thinking in and in the way of exposing mater African material culture in museums? As I showed above, Museums must rethink the reproduction of concepts and information provided by buyers and traders of African material culture. Keep your words like fetish in exhibition on websites and posters doesn't help us to educate the public about the history of African societies. Missionaries and explorers records are essential to accessing to access history histories and agencies of people and empowered things from an internal perspective. But the big public cannot uh, make this interpretation by themselves. Take narrative as the central point of this presentation. I reiterate that what is most of the evident about the Penn Museum attempts to decolonize itself were these moves towards creating complete and well-researched 
narrative throw, throughout its exhibition. The transformation of the African galleries, which opened right before the pandemic, revealed that the new gallery focused significantly on the history of objects, highlighting who made them, where they are from, and the journeys from the original society to arriving at the Penn Museum. The labels that you can see in the museum today do not have a word that refers, refers to the idea of a fetish. African Galleries was curated by an interdisciplinary team who shared their academic research, including myself, Professor Tukufu Zuberi, the lead curator, who is here, Monique Scott, Barbara Ruiz, and Salah. Finally, social movement have been social movements have been fundamental in creating new memory for societies. Thus, the echo of monument decolonization. Thus, the echo of monument mo, monument decolonization movement reached museums. Museums worldwide, worldwide are responding to calls from the street to decolonize their narratives. This modest contribution can, I hope this modest contribution can help us solve some of the challenge of knowledge for a better world, which goes through, uh, through listening to people once colonized. And that's all I have prepared. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. There is a there is an international conversation right now about the restitution, right? I prefer restitution than repatriation because the idea of repatriation doesn't work, right? So, and right now, Penn Museum is engaged in this discussion, um, and they they want to return the object. It's the it's the conversation, but I, my my idea in this in this my my, my main idea about the uh, about the the colonization debate is that the return of the object is not enough because right now museums are talking only about the return of the African objects. Nobody's talking about other objects, so most museums do not want to talk about the African collection anymore. So it's creating a huge silence about the African collections. Because the only thing that ever, no, I'm talking about the public opinion. The public opinion want to talk about restitution, like the transportation, the reallocation of the objects. But what about educating people? What about using the objects to talk about colonialism? That because when you remove the objects from the museum, the museum will not, <laughs> Will not um, the museums will continue being a place of of the representation of colonialism? So the dialogue is more important than the returning the objects. It's my it's my perspective. But, but the British Museum didn't do did it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that they are talking about it. 
they, you know, they're, you know, they're in the midst of a billion dollar transformation and they'll do like the Met. The Met just closed the Africa collection. And so many museums around the world, if you go to them, they have the great Africa, the, the Louvre closed the Africa collection. All these places just closing it and saying we're in the midst of convert, having a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, I, I, I was going to ask, ask that question. So we're talking about reparations, people are talking about that. Um, so uh, how do you envision the best way to, you know, honor uh, and respect that culture and for what is the true meaning and true value of it um, in this context of museums that we have? So, so I'm, I'm, would, would, if, if Africa wasn't colonized, would Africa have to keep having been? Right? When we think about how we remember, right? The music, mm -hmm. and the art, and how we remember, we would never have that. Mm -hmm. but, but the other the other thing that I was thinking about, law mm -hmm. and his lies he told, how long did it take for that to be debunked? How long? Take how, yeah, how long was it before his lies about people's arms and hands being cut off? How long was that? How long did it take before somebody could jump that? That we just now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. It might be. Uh, there was a very little reference to this one. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Um, so I I made this map just for <laughs> highlight the the trajectory of the object, but. Um, since the let's say since the 17, 1970s, there are a lot of people work on the Benin objects because there there's a particular interest for this collection because it's a collection of the, the royalty. So there are a lot of objects about the Benin objects and and many scholars interested, and it's one one point. The other one is. I think that museum has a great responsibility in educating people with the objects instead of returning the objects. I give one, I, you, as you mentioned, the marbles. Let's think about the intention of the, that the museum, when they present the marbles or any kind of uh, Greek uh, or Western uh, object, it's about to show how great they were, how beautiful and civilized they were. So it's, the idea is to put us admired and say, wow, they were great. But in the past, the African, uh, the African uh, exhibitions were full of words like fetish, basket, knife, figure, pendant. So you don't know. No, in the, in the past, we didn't know how to to interpret this this object. So I worked with Renata in the in the Museum of Brazil for for years. So it was very common for students to be laughing when they were looking at the objects, laughing because they they couldn't understand anything about African culture and. Most time we were thinking like, how can you help these people to be more, um, <laughs> to the, how can we teach them about the beauty of this object and teach African history through the objects? So my, my point is, I think the museum should be more engaged in educating people than returning objects because I visit like more than 10 museums, like more than 10 countries in, in, in Africa that they have museums of ethnology. And when you go there, the, the presentation, the narrative about the objects are the same. Fetish, basket, knife, ceramic, bowl. You're like, what? You know, like, uh, instruments for to fish is like they are a small reproduction of the cabinets of curiosity of the 19th century. So I'm making the question: What will happen when the objects go back? What do you do there? Will they continue the same narrative of the objects? 
So I think that the public opinion is very, is very, is manipulated uh, by the idea that the solution for the humanity and the reparation against racism is the returning of the object, but it's not. What the museums want now is to return the object and wash the hands. That's return the object, you know, you're not, but everybody he, he, that's following the debate knows that few countries are asking for objects. And in the case of Benin, they are requiring for the bronzes. But what will happen after they return the bronzes? Everything will be resolved. We will be happy. We will be in one no racial society. The museums will be a beautiful place without any kind of a colonial um, path. Yeah. Um, is there any idea of how many objects are held in private hands as compared to museums? There's a commission right now um, that they are um, collecting all information about um, about the Benin objects spread around the world. The Benin digital, digital project, and but you know that so many pri private the private collector they don't need to know they don't need to say right mm -hmm. so but. Right now, I don't have this information like how many objects are in the institution and how many are being held by private uh, collectors. Mm -hmm. But the Benin yes, the side. More than that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Please join me in uh, thanking. Uh, Thank you.